In this final session, the eighth session on Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, we focus on this remarkable benediction that is speaking grace and peace into the lives of the church at the very outset. Grace to you and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In every one of Paul's letters, it begins with grace and peace to you, and at the end, it becomes grace with be with you. And I suggest that the reason it's to you at the beginning of the letter is that in the letter itself, Paul believes grace and peace are flowing from him through his word, from God to the church. And then when they're done and they get ready to leave the church where the letter has been read and go out into their lives, they go with grace. That's my suggestion for why there's such a consistency in to you at the beginning of the letters and with you at the end of the letters. So in this session, we focus on grace, peace, Father, Lord. Father, grant that we would see these four massive realities for what they really are and their impact in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's focus on grace and how the Father and the Lord Jesus team up to do grace in this letter. Here we are in chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, so that love, when we're dead, undeserving In the bondage of trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And then he inserts, by grace you have been saved. Even though he's going to say that again more fully in 2.8, he inserts it here and thus shows that grace is God dealing with us infinitely better than we deserve. Indeed, so powerfully better than we deserve that it involves raising us from the spiritual death where we could not begin to help ourselves. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So all of this amazing grace raising us from the dead, doing what we could never do for ourselves was aimed at celebrating this grace forever and ever as he lavishes it upon us in eternal ages. Now we're back in chapter 1 to see that ultimate goal of the glorifying of grace again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So the Father blesses us in Christ. So the Father is the source of the blessings, and Christ is the mediator with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, God is the choosing one before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption. That's what a father wants to do. He wants children to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, again, the mediator, according to the purpose of his will. Now, what's the purpose of all of that election, predestination, adoption? To the praise of the glory of his grace. So, grace is massively central in this letter. Everything in all of history, all of redemption, is to praise Praise the glory of grace. It's not surprising then that in the beginning here, he says, grace to you. Therefore, give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father is the origin, the source of all good, and it all flows through Jesus Christ so that thanks go backwards through Jesus Christ to God the Father. Now we turn to peace. 
chapter 2, verse 14, for Christ himself is our peace who has made us both one. So this is Jew and Gentile, us both. In the context, you'll see when we get there, Jew and Gentile, both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility and replaced it with peace by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man at peace in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile. Now here's... Here's another direction of peace. That was vertical, right? Between, between Jew and Gentile. Peace, peace, peace. Removal of hostility. And now, and might reconcile us both to God. Both to God. So this is vertical peacemaking. Reconcile us both to God through the cross. We were alienated from God and alienated from each other. And God, in Christ, the Lord Jesus, makes peace vertically, and he makes peace horizontally between people who are in Christ Jesus. He came and preached peace to you who are far off, that's Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, that's Jews, and he did it to create peace with God, no condemnation, and thus peace with each other in Christ Jesus. So, grace, massive in this letter. Peace, massive in this letter. And both of them flowing from God the Father through the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's think for a minute about the very implications of the word Lord for Jesus Christ. He's talking to slaves here in that first century situation, bond servants, obey your earthly masters. Same word, let's just translate it Lord so we can get the feel of what it means to have Jesus as the Lord. So you bond servants, obey your lords with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the true Lord, the one Lord, and not to man, even though they are called lords. So you have one Lord in heaven, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. The Lord is the one who's the great God of recompense, whether he is a bondservant or is free. And masters, lords, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their Lord and your Lord is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So this is, the reason I quote this is just to show you that the word Lord carries with it an authority that trumps all human authority, whether it's government or parents or teachers or policemen or presidents or masters We have one Lord who indeed calls us to obey our earthly lords, but not absolutely and only up to a point because we have one Lord and all those earthly lords should remember they have a Lord as well. And let's close by just reminding ourselves that we become Christians by seeing and savoring cherishing the Lordship of Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the the dead, you will be saved. You become a Christian by embracing Jesus for all he is, including Lord. And you can't do that on your own. We've already seen you have to be raised from the dead in Ephesians 2. Now here we are in 1 Thessalonians 12. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So to say this and mean it, of course, a computer can say it. The point is, say it from the heart and mean it and love it. Nobody can do that except by the Holy Spirit. In fact, This is the last text I'll look at when I say love it. Ephesians 6.24 Grace be with you all. 
Grace be with all. So we're closing out with grace be with all who love our Lord. Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. You don't just submit to the Lordship of Jesus in order to be saved. You embrace the Lordship of Jesus with love that he's your Lord. You're thrilled that you have a a Lord and a Father. It comes with grace. It comes with peace. It flows from God the Father. It flows through the triumphant, invincible lordship of Jesus Christ, and it lands on us with (laughs) this incredible word in verse 7 of chapter 2, the riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus forever and ever. So this is huge. Grace, totally undeserved, infinite better treatment than we ever could imagine coming to us dead in our trespasses. Peace forged at the cross by the Father and the Son, both vertically and horizontally, flowing from a Father who has chosen us before the foundation of the world and has adopted us into his family and established us under the all-gracious, peaceful Lordship of his Son, Jesus Christ.